up on this Thursday edition of Daybreak Jubilation at the European Space Agency as the Rosetta mission's lander makes a historic landing on a comet hurtling through space. President Park Geun-hye calls for greater economic cooperation with India as she holds talks with the country's recently elected Prime Minister ahead of the East Asia Summit in Myanmar. Plus, Korea is on hold as hundreds of thousands of students in the nation prepare to take the potentially life-changing college entrance exam. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6am on Thursday, November 13th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. Now, it's being hailed as a huge step for civilization and a truly historic moment for humankind. The Rosetta mission has successfully made the first ever landing on a comet, despite a couple of malfunctions along the way. The European Space Agency says it received confirmation that after a roughly seven-hour descent, the mission's small robotic lander named Philae touched down on the surface of Comet 67PCG, although it's not currently anchored to the comet. Now, this landing is a feat of space engineering when you consider that the whole expedition hinged on unproven landing technology and the comet is whizzing through space at a staggering 18 kilometers per second. Scientists hope to discover more about comets, which are predominantly clusters of dust and ice. Back here on Earth, and more specifically Korea, hundreds of thousands of high school seniors will take the most important tests of their young lives today. 640,000 students will sit down for their college scholastic ability test, which officially starts at 8.40 a.m. Korea time. That's in roughly two and a half hours. And the test is going to last for eight hours today. Their results will decide whether they can get into the universities of their choice. The Korea Meteorological Administration issued a cold wave advisory early this morning in a great many areas around the country. And in consideration for exam takers, offices around the nation will open one hour later than normal today and more subway trains and buses are running, so hopefully students are not late for this uh, very important set of exams. Even airplanes will be forbidden uh, from taking off or landing for 35 minutes in the afternoon during the listening test hours. Now, after wrapping up her stay in Beijing for APEC, Korean President Park Geun-hye arrived in Myanmar on Wednesday for the ASEAN Plus 3 and East Asia summits. And soon after touching down in the South Asian country, she held a one-on-one -on -one meeting with her Indian counterpart, Ao Che Yusan, who's travelling with the president, for this report from Myanmar. Ahead of this year's East Asia Summit in Myanmar, President Park Geun-hye held talks with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi for the first time since he took office in May. Uh, I hope we can cooperate to further strengthen Korea and India's relations. Praising Prime Minister Modi's bold initiatives to attract foreign investors to India's industrial and infrastructure projects, President Buck asked him to support Korean firms aiming to win large-scale orders. To that end, the Indian leader welcomes such participation and investments by Korea. Suggesting cooperation in coal gas development and nuclear energy, the Korean president invited her Indian counterpart to make a state visit to Korea next year. On Thursday, the 18 East Asia summit state leaders will discuss pressing global issues such as the Ebola outbreak and the threat posed by Islamic State militants in the Middle East. At the following ASEAN Plus 3 summit, President Buck plans to talk about her unification drive and the North Korean nuclear issue with the 10 Southeast Asian nations, China and Japan. 
Attention is also being paid to the ASEAN launching their economic community by the end of next year. The ASEAN is Korea's number two trading region with a total trade volume of $135 billion last year. Choi Yusan, Arirang News, Nepida. Now, the United States and China have reached new climate, military, trade and visa agreements during two days of talks in the Chinese capital. Watchers also say Presidents Barack Obama and Xi Jinping made great strides in soothing their often strained relationship. Our Huang sang reports on that meeting. In his bilateral meeting with U.S. President Barack Obama on Wednesday, Chinese President Xi Jinping stressed the importance of a new model for the relationship between the two world powers. The establishment of a new model for the relationship between China and the U.S. is in line with the basic interests of the people from both our countries, and that it can also help protect the peace, stability and prosperity of the Asia-Pacific region and the world. At the meeting, China and the United States agreed on new targets for greenhouse gas emissions. President Obama set a new goal of reducing U.S. levels from between 26 percent to 28 percent by 2025, compared with 2005 levels. President Xi did not set a specific target, but said emissions would peak by 2030, marking the first time that China, the world's biggest polluter, set an approximate date for such a goal. The two leaders also agreed on reducing the possibility of military clashes in the air and sea. President Obama said despite their differences, he was encouraged by the honest and constructive dialogue he had with his Chinese counterpart. Uh, but uh, what I've been very encouraged by is uh, your willingness, Mr. President, uh, to engage uh, in a honest and constructive dialogue uh, around those differences and ensuring that we manage them. Uh, in a peaceful and effective way. Noting that this year marks the 35th year of diplomatic relations between the world's two largest economies, President Xi said China was willing to further expand cooperation with the U.S. Hwang sang Arirang News. The United States has expressed its support for the European Union's push to get the leadership in North Korea referred to the International Criminal Court for its human rights violations. The U.S. Special Envoy for North Korean Human Rights Issues, Robert King, who is currently in Seoul, says the United States will back the resolution at the U.N. Third Committee's vote next week. He also said the recent release of two Americans held in North Korea will not affect Washington's policies on the North's denuclearization or its human rights issues. Korea is calling on Japan to explain why Korean singer Lee Sung Chul was recently denied entry into the country. Seoul's foreign ministry summoned an official from the Japanese embassy on Wednesday to express its regret over the matter. It said the Korean public wanted clear answers over why Lee was held for four hours at an airport in Tokyo last Sunday before being sent on the next flight home. Reiterating earlier statements from Tokyo, the Japanese diplomat said details could not be revealed due to uh, certain privacy issues, but stressed that it had nothing to do with the singer's recent concert on Dokdo Island, as has been widely speculated. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Now, Korea will dispatch its first group of medical personnel to the Ebola-stricken country of Sierra Leone later on this Thursday. Seoul's Foreign Affairs Ministry says the volunteering doctors, nurses and military officers will first visit Britain before travelling to the West African country. The group is being dispatched in advance to uh, check the medical facilities and working conditions in Sierra Leone. They'll stay there until November 21st. The Korean team will work at a British Ebola treatment facility in the capital Freetown with other health experts from countries such as the UK, Denmark and Norway. After receiving assessments from the first task force team, the Korean government will decide upon the final number of medical staff to send to Sierra Leone. Back here in Korea and the nation's official 
Unemployment rate currently stands at 3.2 percent, a figure which it's fair to say would be the envy of many countries around the world if it was a true reflection of the situation. However, when new international standards are applied to those figures, the actual or de facto jobless rate jumps to more than 10 percent, which is, of course, a less enviable figure, our Hang Jie reports. The Singlish Academy in Korea is packed with people who are preparing to find a job, but most of them are not categorized as unemployed. Statistics Korea, which compiles the data, only counts those who don't have a job despite their efforts to get one as unemployed, and that means whether they have actually filled out applications in the past four weeks. So the agency released a so-called real unemployment rate starting this month based on new standards by the International Labor Organization. The actual jobless rate that includes those who are preparing to get a job underemployed or who are discouraged from finding a job stood at over 10 percent in October. That is up around seven percentage points from the official unemployment rate. We hope the new jobs data could help understand various situations in the labor market and help design policies. Pundits have been critical of the official jobs figure, saying it's too narrow to reflect the true state of unemployment. With the extra data, experts point to the need for government policies to support women and the younger generation who make up the majority of the country's underemployed and discouraged job seekers. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, doing your banking by smart device is gaining popularity fast. And to help customers better manage their finances while they're on the go, local banks here in Korea and app develop developers are opening up even more mobile financial services to the public. Our Shin Se-min reports. Banking on the go is becoming easier and more common. What started with simple transactions is now shifting to more complex ones, like applying for mortgage loans. Uri Bank is hoping to release a product early next year that would let users submit essential information for such loans through a smartphone app. The information would then be looked over and evaluated by bank representatives. And more services are on the way. Samsung Electronics is introducing the Samsung Wallet and SK Telecom the Bluetooth Low Energy Payment, which makes it easier for smartphone users to receive the financial services. This week, mobile messaging service Down Kakao rolled out Bank Wallet Kakao, a service that allows users to transfer money to friends just like they would send a text message. It allows users to wire up to 100,000 won or roughly 90 U.S. dollars per day without having to know the recipient's account information. Subscribers will soon be able to withdraw cash from some 75,000 automated teller machines just through a few taps of the smartphone. These concerns are different since this directly involves personal financial data. Consumers need to check for themselves whether the services have been authorized by relevant organizations. Providing greater security will be key to expanding the market even further, especially with concerns still present after the personal data of at least 20 million bank and credit card users in Korea was leaked earlier this year. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now to a fun event taking place in the Korean capital and the annual Food Week Korea event has kicked off this week in Seoul with exhibitors from around the world showing off their locally produced food as well as offering hopefully a sneak peek into the future of the food industry. Kim Minji reports. Food experts from around the globe have gathered under one roof united by the theme Food for the Future. The annual Food Week Korea offers companies a chance to expand their scope of business and discuss changing industry trends. Food Week Korea will be an opportunity for the domestic food industry to promote exports as well as increase exchanges abroad. ASEAN member countries are also taking part to help promote their lesser known food products. I'm great. I can, can be here so we can promote our products from Bunai. We hope uh, we can find the, the this market to introduce this blue shrimp in the Korean markets. Solely using locally produced foods, they held a special cooking session to give visitors a chance to taste a range of their unique dishes. 
It was a great experience to try food we can't eat every day. I was able to try shrimp, dried fish, as well as some alcoholic beverages. Also on display are Korean food products that highlight changing trends like the rise in single households and demand for food on the go. From Korean style burritos to pre packaged noodles, rice, and other ready to eat meals, the wide selection is attention grabbing. And small and medium sized companies are also here in full force to capitalize on opportunities to sell overseas, like this local company that hopes to increase its brand awareness and gain a competitive edge in the global market. Along with the aim of boosting development in the food industry, exhibitors have come with hopes of promoting their products to a larger consumer base at the event which runs through Saturday at COEX in southern Seoul. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Right, well, it's time now to get a look through the global headlines we're following on this Thursday morning here in Seoul. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim, standing by at the News Centre. Good morning, Eunice. Good morning to you, Mark. We begin with the Ebola crisis in West Africa. The country of Mali is bracing itself for a second and potentially more far-reaching outbreak with an Ebola death that had fallen under the radar. A 70-year-old religious leader from Guinea had been treated for kidney failure at a major clinic in Mali's capital of Bamako. It wasn't until two weeks after his death that authorities were able to confirm Ebola had been the underlying cause after a test was ordered on a sick nurse who had helped treat him. She died on Tuesday. Authorities are scrambling to quarantine people who came into contact with Mali's two latest victims. This as the World Health Organization released another update which showed more than 5,100 people had died of Ebola through Sunday. And some troubling images out of Turkey, where three visiting American sailors were assaulted by a group of Turkish nationalists as they disembarked from a guided missile destroyer docked in Istanbul for a few days. The video was posted online by the group, the Turkish Youth Union, and showed paint-filled balloons being hurled at the sailors as others sacked them, calling them murderers. The attack happened in a touristy MNU district in broad daylight, as you can see there. The U.S. Embassy in Turkey called it appalling as Ankara promised to investigate. An ancient find at the Greek burial site at Amphipolis. Archaeologists there have unearthed a skeleton inside a tomb from the time of Alexander the Great, fascinating the watching public. Greece's culture ministry said the skeleton likely belonged to a distinguished public figure, citing the tomb's lavishness and dimensions. It said the construction was extremely expensive. That was, in all probability, a monument to a mortal who was worshipped by his society at the time. And a good Thursday morning to you all as we kick things off in baseball. Now less than 24 hours since it was revealed to the public that the highest bid for Kim Gwang Hyun was $2 million by the San Diego Padres. The SK Wyverns and the former KBO MVP have decided to accept the bid. Now despite the highest bid being far less than the $5 million that the SK Wyverns were looking for, the team left the decision all up to Kim Gwang Hyun himself. And after a day of thinking through the option, the lefty ace has decided to accept the offer and start negotiating a deal that will make him just the third player from the KBO to go over to the majors. The San Diego Padres, who lack lefties in their starting rotation, finished third in the NL West behind the LA Dodgers and the 2014 World Series champions, the San Francisco Giants. And now shifting over to women's football, where G Messi Ji Ho Yun set a new Korean goal record when she scored her 31st and 32nd A match goal during the 15 0 thrashing of Guam during the East Asian Cup. Now, the Chelsea Lady Star broke the record in her 65th A match, with her first goal being scored back in 2006. 
And now with that, uh, baseball season's over, so all the attention is currently in the KBL and the V-League now. So let's first move over to Wednesday night's KBL action, where the Busan KT Sonic Boom Cruise passed the Seoul Samsung Thunders 84-60, to thanks to EJ Do's 28-point effort. You want to take a look at the Seoul SK Knights take on the Incheon ET-Line Elephants. Now, right from the get-go, SK's offense struggles from the paint as ET-Line takes advantage, outscoring SK 21-13 in the first quarter, before SK turns it around in the second quarter to take a slim 40-39 lead going into halftime. Now both teams keeping it close in the third quarter, but SK runs away with it with a big fourth quarter here with SK's Aaron Haynes posting up a near triple-double with 22 points, 10 rebounds, and 7 assists as the SK Knights hold on to win this one 86-73. And now shifting over to Wednesday night's V-League action this time, starting off in the Women's League, where GS Cartex took on the IBK Altos. Now just an epic match here in a rematch of last year's championship series as both teams go back and forth through four sets, with GS Cartex barely forcing a final fifth set. But IBK led by Destiny Hooker's game-high 36 points, IBK takes a fifth set 15-10 for a 3-2 victory. We went over on the men's league here. The struggling Uri Card looking for the upset win here. Take the first set with ease 25 21. But Liberman Algamez and Moon Sung Lee tears it up for Hyundai Capital, combining for 49 points as the Skywalkers sweep the next three sets for a 3 to 1 victory. And now finishing things off in Germany, where the nation is set to become the first in passing a law that will make doping a criminal offense. With sports doping becoming a worldwide problem right now, Germany has stepped up with a proposed law being presented at the Bundestag in Berlin. Now, athletes caught doping will face prison time up to three years, with foreign athletes caught in Germany possibly facing similar punishments as well. Meanwhile, anyone who provides the drugs, including doctors, may also face up to 10 years in prison if found guilty. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. Well, it's a big day for test takers and weather is not being so cooperative. It's the coldest morning of the season that we are waking up to. Uh, temperatures have dropped to minus two here in Seoul, but it feels a lot colder at about minus seven. So be sure to dress warmly and daytime highs will not rise that much as well, only hovering at about five in many regions. Also, the level of fine dust particles are quite high this morning morning as well for here in the capital and the surrounding areas three times higher than normal so you also might want to wear a face mask before heading out with that in mind let's take a closer look at today's cold readings a daily low here in Seoul started out at minus two then the daytime high will only make it to five while Taewoo and Gwangju will top out at seven and Busan will climb to nine this afternoon and on to other regions Jeju Island and Daejeon will be getting up to nine and six later on while Tukdo should see a high of four. Well, it should feel like more like mid-December today, so be sure to dress warmly and stay warm. That's all for Korea, and here's international weather for viewers around the world. And good luck to all those students taking their college scholastic ability test today. I'm sure everyone will do very well. Well, that's all we have for now. More online. Don't forget to check out our website, adirang.co.kr forward slash news for more stories. I'll be back at 10 a.m. Korea time. Till then, goodbye.